I think uh, it's time to get started. So let me move forward. All right, hi everyone and welcome. Uh, I'm Eunice Yang and presenting with me is Chris Fick. And together we're the UX research team at Pros. And thank you to Hexagon for inviting us to talk about usability testing. But before we dive into that, uh, we'd like to remind you of one of the reasons why Hexagon has organized this entire design sprint series. Hexagon is working with an amazing organization called Blue Chip Scholars, which enables young women who are interested in STEM to acquire the skills, experience, and network needed to pursue their interests and become innovators and strategic leaders. So how it works is that scholars like the ones shown here are matched with a mentors group to help guide them with creating and executing projects that they're interested in. Oops, I pressed that accidentally. Um, so Hexagon is working with Bootchip Scholars to design an app that helps scholars better visualize their goals and track their progress. The app will also help mentors better engage and support the scholars. So this is essentially what you've been working on this entire design sprint series. All right, so to recap, if you've participated in the first workshop of the series, you learn to empathize with users and define the problem space. Uh, in the second workshop, you learn to ideate and paper prototype. Some of you went on to combine everyone's ideas into wireframes, and then Jane graciously made those wireframes into an interactive prototype that you will be testing today. We have one prototype for the mentors and one for the scholars. All right, Chris. All right, hi everyone. This is Chris. So just to go over what we're going to be looking at today. Um, first, we'll start with a real high level overview of what usability testing is and what you can learn from it. Then we'll actually give you a chance to design a usability study that we've kind of already set up a framework for. You'll get to test your prototypes with um, real users and then summarize your findings and discuss them as a group. So first off, what is usability testing? Um, simply put, usability testing is, whoops, excuse me on that. <laughs> sorry. Eunice, I think you might have to, there we go. Okay, sorry. Um, so usability testing is just a way to evaluate how easy something is to use, and it's really by observing real users as they complete specific tasks. You wanna use consistent tax, tasks so you can track across different users and look for similarities in the findings. All right, so what can you learn from usability testing? Um, quite frankly, can they use your product? Can they try to accomplish what they're trying to do? And is it easy to do so? Um, is your design easy to navigate? Can users get around on it? Is it clear where they wanna go in the next steps? You're always gonna find something that can be improved. This might come from user feedback, something they say is confusing, or you can see if they're struggling with or have problems in certain areas. And how does your design compare? Does it compare, does your website compare against a competitor's website? Is it easier to use or faster? Um, or if you're redesigning a site or a software, is your new design um, easier than your old design? If not, then you might, not, might choose not to actually go forward with the redesign. So as far as designing a study, you always wanna set out with a research goal in mind. Um, you're probably not gonna be evaluating an entire website in one um, study, for example. So you wanna look at what are you actually trying to accomplish. Then you wanna determine the tasks that are actually going to let you see if a user can accomplish and go through those steps. And you're gonna to wanna to see what metrics to use to measure that and to give feedback on whether it was successful or easy. You're gonna create a testing script, um, both with scenarios for the tasks for your user and participant, um, and also for the moderator, their dialogue and the steps that they wanna go through to keep track of, of everything. Recruiting is often one of the most difficult parts, especially if you have a really specific user group. Um, today, we've done that for you uh, with some of the blue chip scholars who are actually gonna come in and be your real participants. So you're gonna test with the real users of the, the future users of this app. Um, you always wanna practice. You wanna do a pilot study. This lets you kind of be comfortable and familiar with the script. Uh, it also then gives you a chance to adjust anything if you need to, your tasks or, or the scenarios. And then the fun part, um, you get to Go and test with real users. So when we ran, um, Eunice and I did a conference, um, the Send UX conference last year. We used this example of Velvet Taco, a restaurant here in Houston. 
And we wanted this, our research objective was to see if we could improve their um, online order rate. In other words, people could actually complete the order online without dropping off and calling instead. So first we wanted to just use um, some more subjective measures of, of observation to see if users could get through the site. Were they having trouble? Were they going to kind of the wrong place on the site? Then we also wanted to have more objective um, quantitative measures uh, to actually say if it was easy um, or difficult to go through the steps. So what did we choose to use? Well, we measured um, these quantitative measures, time on task, literally just from start to finish, how long did it take to go through the order? Success rate, were they able to get through without making any errors? Um, were they able to put the order in that we asked them to put in on the first try? And then click and page counts, literally how many steps did it take and how many clicks did it take through to get them through? So for examples of each of those, um, time on task, we measured the task, the time of the entire task. Now we only measured um, people who completed the task successfully. If they made errors or they got stuck or hung up or just kind of gave up, then we didn't include that in the time. Uh, we also broke it up into subtasks. This is really helpful because then you can see where people are struggling. Um, for example, if time, if a certain subtask is taking longer than you'd expect, or if it has a lower success rate, then that's an area where you might want to focus and make improvements. And then click and page counts. Um, actually just recording where people click on the screen, is there, that shows you if there's a clear call to action, if it's really straightforward, or is there too much stuff on the screen and people are choosing different paths that might not lead them to the, to the right uh, next step. Um, this isn't the entire flow, but you can kind of get an idea of all the steps involved. Also, this gives you an opportunity to see if you can cut any steps in the process that are just redundant. Um, any questions at this point, or I'll hand it back over to Eunice. Okay. okay. All right. So I will move on and discuss the testing script outline. All right. So here are the basic parts of a testing script. Um, first is introduction. You'll want to prepare the participant so he or she knows what will happen in the session. Then you'll ask the participant to read the scenario and task that you make up. Once the task is over, you'll follow up with a set of questions to further understand what their experience was like. So let's go through what a testing script would look like for the Velvet Taco study. Um, first, let's start with the introduction. Uh, the first thing you do is introduce yourself and your goal. So I'll say, hi, I'm Eunice. Thank you for participating in my study. I'm interested in improving users' experience of the Velvet Taco website. Next, let them know what to expect. So today we're going to explore the website as if we're potential customers. We'll go through the scenario of placing an order. Let them know that they should think out loud, but pretend that you're not there. So I might say, please talk me through what you're thinking as you go. However, I can't answer any questions until you're done. Participants may be reluctant to say anything negative. So remind them that, that whatever they say won't hurt your feelings. Also, they might feel that they're being judged. So remind them that there are no right or wrong answers. So I might say, please be honest and remember that we're evaluating the website, not you. And always end with, do you have any questions before we begin? Okay. Um, here's some additional info that you might want to include in the intro introduction. Recording the session can be a lifesaver, especially if you miss something. So ask permission to record. Sometimes you want to collect demographic information like age and occupation. So ask that in the introduction. It actually can work as an icebreaker as well. And you should definitely include this last point in your script today because the prototype you're testing is not fully clickable. So give them a heads up that it's still a work in progress. All right, now moving on to the scenario task. So the scenario is, imagine that you had to work through lunch and want to pick up food from the Velvet Taco, or from Velvet Taco in Montrose. You want to order ahead using their mobile site. So first provide them with a starting point. You will start by going to velvettaco.com on your phone. This ensures that all your participants start at the same place. If one of your measures is time on task, this is where you would start your timer. Then provide the task. You want one falafel taco without onions and one order of tater tots. Add these items to your cart. Make sure, again, to provide all the details they need to complete the task. Finally, let the participant know where the task ends. So stop when you've found the total price of your order and say it out loud. Again, when you're measuring the time on task, this is where you would stop and record the time. If the participant arrives at the correct price, the task is completed successfully. 
And here are some tips with the scenario and task. It's always best to provide the participant with a copy of the task uh, so they can refer to it during the session. Ask them to read it out loud. Asking them to read it out loud ensures that they actually read it and they understand what to do. And when you do your testing later today, you can add the scenario and task to the chat so the participant can, can have access to it and they can read it out loud. Okay, any questions before we move on? You feel free to speak up. Cool. All right. The last part are the follow-up questions. So try to keep them open-minded, oh, open-minded, open-ended, and avoid leading questions. Here are some examples. What are your general impressions of the site? What did you like about the site? What did you not like about the site? Can you think of anything that can be improved? You may also have some specific questions based on what you're testing, so you can always include that here as well. Another part of the follow-up questions is that you can include a rating scale. Sometimes it's difficult to summarize a user's impressions, so this, this is one way to like quantify their experience. There are a lot of rating scales. Uh, you probably heard of SUS, System Usability Scale, or NPS, Net Promoter Score. Um, you can choose one of the many established skill, scales, or you can just decide to use uh, a general satisfaction rating like this, the one you see right now. Just be consistent and make sure you use it um, the same way across all your participants. Now, Chris and I like to use the UMUX light survey. This consists of two questions about the ease of use and meeting users' needs. Uh, it apparently correlates very well with the SUS, which is a 10 question scale, which you could use Either way, yeah. Okay, uh, it's about time to start the exercises. Oh, before we start, any questions about the testing script? A question, Eunice, actually. Yeah, sure. um, about the net promoter score, um, I think it was a podcast that maybe we listened to for one of our article clubs, but um, Erica Hall, I think, was talking about net promoter score, that it's not as reliable because it is asking a user to predict their behavior in the future instead of describing their behavior in the past. Do you guys have any opinions on how, how to take that score? I'd say that, um, so I've used Net Promoter kind of looking at a company metric overall. So for example, if people wanted to rate, you know, how likely they are to recommend Hexagon, for example, um, then it's fairly reliable, but I don't tend to use it for as much for usability testing because the usability is like, would you recommend the Velvet Taco website um, rather than a, kind of an ease of use question. So I think it has it maybe has its place, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for usability testing. Okay, well, I know um, we use usertesting.com at work and that is built into their metrics tab. And I've always just kind of ignored that because <laughs> I didn't know how it related. So thanks. Yeah, yeah, we try to ignore that as well. <laughs> I was gonna ask a similar question because we use SUS a lot, the yeah. system usability score. And so I think you kind of ended up answering it. Um, I hadn't heard of the UM UX Lite survey. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering kind of how you guys maybe either shifted from SUS to that, um, the one that you mentioned, or if you had thoughts about how to kind of justify SUS sometimes because we've definitely had some um, issues with people actually believing in the score or being able to read it because it kind of reads on almost more of a like a grade scale um, mm. and so we've just I've, I've experienced a lot of issues with reliability of the score or believability in the score. Gotcha. Christine. I know oh. <laughs> um, before we kind of came into before Eunice or I came to pros uh, SUS was being used more often and because it is a really well validated measure it's just really verbose to ask someone to go through 10 different questions. Um, and some of the questions in there are actually like uh, intended to make sure that people are answering consistently. Um, the UX UM light does correlate well. It just, we just found that it's a fairly easy measure to get at what you're looking at. And, and also that the metrics, you get so much more insight from other things like comments, um, that satisfaction metrics are something that it's good to do to benchmark, but it's not gonna be like the big biggest takeaway. And you and said the UMA, UX light, there was only three questions? Two questions. It's just two questions. Yeah, okay. so the light part is what makes it two questions. I think the <laughs> UMUX survey itself was four questions and then they reevaluated um, how well it correlated with SUS and they realized it can just be broken down to two. Wow, 
Okay. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, I can send out an article afterwards where they used it and they um, showed how it compared for with the SUS and then how they did it for like a bunch of enterprise software and like, see, you know, see how the SUS scores for how the SUS is for all these different types of software and for B2C or B2B. Awesome. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So let's start with the exercises. Um, first, you'll be put into one of three groups. The red team will test the mentor prototype and the blue and green team, green, blue and green team will test the scholar prototype. Now everyone will be working off the same mirror board, but each team will have their own workspace. And that's indicated by the background color you see here. Now the first thing you should do once you get into your groups is to get to know the Fright prototype. The link is in the header, and it's the same one that Lena sent out yesterday. Also, Meredith, Chris, and I will, be, will each be in one of the rooms as facilitators, so feel free to ask us any questions at any time. For your first activity, you're going to design your study. Oh, I'm sorry, the screenshot's so blurry. Um, you would typically start with the research questions, but because the prototype is somewhat limited in what workflows you can test, we fill those questions out for you. So as a team, you'll decide what you'll measure um, and what you'll measure to answer those questions. And then you'll write a test script. That's the introduction, task and scenario, and follow-up questions. Um, I would re recommend designating one person to scribe for your team. And everything we went through with the Velvet Taco example, is also on the mirror board, so feel free to reference or copy from that. The link to the mirror board is here on the bottom left, you can see that, um, and Elena will add it to the chat if she hasn't already, and you will have 10 minutes for this activity. All right, good luck. Oh, and yeah, I guess Elena will put us in rooms right now. <laughs> yes, I've got the rooms kind of set up, um, and these are the same rooms that you'll stay in throughout the, the rest of today's session. Um, so like she said, Meredith, Chris, or Eunice will be in one of those rooms and they'll kind of help you along. Um, but I'm going to stay in the main room. So if for any reason you need to come back to the main room or ask for any other help, um, I will be there, but I did just put the link in the chat. Go ahead and click on that. Um, because you kind of lose the main room chat once you get into the breakout room. Um, but all of your facilitators have that link as well to help you. All right. So, um, Chris, you want to start us off? <laughs> sure. All right. So first of all, were there any questions? Hopefully everyone got a chance to get through and design their, um, finish their study design. Questions? Cool. Oh. cool. Okay. So what we're going to do now for this activity is we're actually going to um, pilot. And so you're going to practice on whoever your room, uh, let's see. So for the mentors, it's going to be actually be Jessica. Um, and then it'll be me and Eunice. So this gives you a chance to adjust your script at all if you feel you the need. Um, you also have to assign roles. So one person is going to be the moderator, then someone can count depending on what metrics you decided and everyone else will just be taking notes. You can take them right on the mirror board or if it's easier for you to take them somewhere else like Word and paste it in, that's up to you too. And we're gonna have 10 minutes for this even though when we get to our participants, we will have 15 minutes for each participant. So this all gives, so gives you a time to check out are my tasks, uh, am I able to accomplish my tasks? Are my participant able to accomplish my tasks in the time allotted? Maybe this is a silly question, but if we're taking notes in a Miro board and also watching a virtual click through, is that all happening in one screen or should we be like taking notes over on the side and then transferring them to a Miro board? So the participant's gonna be asked to share their screen. Um, so they'll be sharing it in the Zoom window. So yeah, it might be better to kind of have two windows, the Zoom window on the side, but I know that can be kind of tricky. I'm on a laptop, so I know there's kind of limited space. Yeah, I would put them side by side if you can, or, okay. you know, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's go All back right. into rooms. I'm gonna go ahead and send you back into your rooms. Thanks. All right, Chris. Back. Oops. All right. So hopefully everyone got their findings together. So for this part, um, let's see. Yeah, we're gonna take a few minutes just to um, see if there's any questions. Actually take a longer time. Chris, I don't know if you saw that in the chat. Well, did anyone have any questions about this process of kind of combining your affinity mapping into your findings? Or any questions in general? <laughs> Uh, 
I have one question, and it's probably really obvious to a lot of other people, but um, when you're in that stage, um, is that the time to be brainstorming anything else that, that didn't come up through the participants' experience? Or is this really to be focused solely on their reactions and responses and improvements that came out of those learnings? Good question. Um, so for me, what I like to do is before I even do testing, I come up with ideas of how to improve whatever I'm testing or about to test and try to make sure that during testing, I can either find evidence to support that or to not support it. Um, and then you can sort of make sure that during feedback you're, or during your testing session, you're getting users feedback, just like general impressions and like them navigating through the app, but also you're getting feedback about some ideas that you have, if that makes sense. So like maybe in the questions you might've said, like if we had moved this, you know, button over here onto the left, you know, do you think that, would you prefer it that way? Or would you prefer it where it is today? Something like that. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And I agree, Eunice, totally. Um, and it's great also to have your other stakeholders involved. So collaborate when you're even discussing the, even beforehand, like when you're discussing those follow-up questions. So you know that you have at least have a chance to, to get at what they might want to learn out of the study as well. Anyone else? Do you guys tend to do totally separate studies per each version of your prototype? Or will you do a version, do some testing, go back to the drawing board with the insights, do with some more testing? Like how many rounds are we talking before kind of sharing out to your stakeholders? Chris, you wanna take this? Sure, so um, ideally, you want to do iterative testing and make improvements. We, like at Pros, we, we try to include our stakeholders throughout the whole process. So just be completely transparent about it um, rather than like box things away and then come out with this great proclamation of this is what we think you should do. Because um, people can be, when people are involved in the discussion, they're way more to be like, um, a, to kind of be a champion of what comes out of it if they've been involved in the steps along the way. Um, but I would say a lot of times we do three rounds of testing we do like an initial concept design. We tested it. We we iterate on it, um, and then we test it again. If if you've kind of nailed it in the first design and everyone loves it, then there's probably not as much to do as if it just doesn't work out. Then you have to take literally back to the drawing board. Then it might take more rounds. Yeah, and to add to that, um, if you have multiple ideas, like you're not really sure which one to test, test both at the same time. You can do some sort of A/B testing or present um, both and you do the same tasks with both. Um, just uh, maybe you can do one group, if you have enough participants, you can have one group that does that tests prototype A and the other group tests prototype B. If you don't have that many, you could do both um, for each participant and then you just sort of alternate as to which one they see first. This way there's like not a bias. And a lot of times when we do that, what we find is our final design has elements from both of our initial designs yeah. kind of merged together. Yeah, we'll make like a hybrid, like mm -hmm. the best of both worlds type of thing. Okay. Great questions. Oh, did I do okay. that? Okay. That's, I think that's ready. So um, do you want me to share my the mirror board and we can zoom in or Elena, is it better to view? Oh, I should, I, I'll, yeah, I'll just share since I'm already sharing now, sorry. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, and I'm gonna move you guys over here. Let me zoom out. I think we want to maybe start with the red team with the yeah the mentor group. Okay, hold on one second. Ugh. All right, just gonna move it over here. Trying. Sorry, my mouse is is jumpy, and now I have to use my laptop. So, come on. Okay. All right, and I'm gonna hide you guys your mouse, <laughs> your cursors. Okay. All right, so do we have a, a brave volunteer from the red team to talk us through your findings and your suggested improvements? How brave do we have to be? 
Oh, just don't make Meredith do it. Yeah, go ahead, Amy. <laughs> okay, so um, our findings uh, were that um, the users um, in both cases were struggling with um, the most recent message, like trying to find, they, they, they found themselves always trying to find the uh, comment thread um, that, that matched what it was they were trying to do or what has, had already been said. Um, they had, I'm just reading this, um, they had, uh, um, so th the other thing that happened a lot was that they, um, they weren't sure what was happening or what was going to happen it when they hit a button. So they would like try it and see what happened. If it didn't work, then they try something else. And so there's the learning curve there, but um, the call to action buttons weren't um, uh, as clear. And uh, sort of that went along with that, things like um, the save button, it wasn't clear that they had actually saved the comment um, uh, afterwards. You know, it cl they clicked it and nothing happened. There was no response or nothing, you know, you did it or something. And so <clears throat> if they were posting a message, they could go and find that message, go, okay, no, it did actually work. But otherwise they couldn't tell that what they did worked or not. So uh, the recommendations are to change the wording around um, so that um, uh, all of the messages are in a central location. So you can go back and clearly see what, where the, what the messages are and um, where, um, I'm sorry, what, and what's happened along the way. Um, it, in addition to that, there was the idea of uh, um, from the main screen where you see the, the students listed, I guess they're students, sorry, I'm still sort of new to this, um, that they, uh, um, that there's something there that shows that you've got mess, a message from that person, whether it's an alert or an icon or something that says, um, you know, maybe you have two, a number two or something um, uh, on that particular student. So you know what's going on and that there's something you need to look at. And then um, icons on the home page profile to describe um, those interactions. That's what I just said. And um, more hinting with regards to um, highlighting or something, some sort of feedback that says you've hit this button or you've been here, or maybe even this is where you are, right? You're in this section right now. So maybe that section is grayed out or highlighted in a different way. If that makes sense. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. That's really great. All right. Okay. I'm just gonna move down to the uh, scholar prototype feedback. All right, sorry, it's just slow here. Okay. So anyone from this team would like to comment? I can pick somebody, but I feel bad. Uh, I can go. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, so um, for our findings, uh, we had two categories for our scholars. Um, there was difficulty locating the messages and difficulty locating pending skills. So a commonality that we saw was it did take them multiple attempts to um, kind of understand where they would want to find their feedback. Um, the users, uh, the testers, scholars, sorry, I, um, the scholars, um, they wouldn't, they couldn't find the messages on the first try. Um, they would often be gravitated to the notification area. Um, to which they would click on the message that was there. You know, they would read the messages and then they saw, okay, I have a message from our school, um, mentor. So they click there, but um, once there, it seemed like they were a little stuck on where exactly the message would be. Uh, that functionality would pop the message screen out, but it wasn't very visible for them. Um, and they did, they, uh, we got a number of times that they would click on notifications versus how many times they would click on this, uh, the messaging icon. So notifications, there was a click of four times and then messaging two times. For the pending skill to see if they can find a, locate a pending skill, um, one, out, 
one out of the two scholars noticed that there was a green check mark over one of the skills to indicate something different about them about it but two out of the two scholars were unable to distinguish which skills were pending um, and there wasn't an exact understanding of what a soft skill versus hard skill was and there was a need for more information so for our recommended approve uh, improvements would be make the messages more apparent by making it its own screen um, make the skills more understandable by distinguishing which ones are currently pending which are being worked on and which have been achieved. And finally, or um, add a tooltip next to the label uh, to distinguish what a soft and hard skill is. And one of the recommendations while we were doing this was also to have a frequently asked question section to indicate how to use the app as a beginner and define any terms. Great. I think that was pretty clear. Anyone have any comments or feedback? I wonder, I'm curious how the other team went and whether their findings are the same. I'll move on down. Oh, I can go faster now. Okay. All right. Team Green, who wants to volunteer to just walk us through their findings and recommendations? Uh, I can. Uh, so we had similar topics. Um, I think for, so the other group said two out of two didn't find messages on the first attempt. Um, I think for us, so I guess that'll come out if I just go through this, but um, users did have difficulties finding the messages. And we think that part of that was just there needs to be a sort of separate display for the messages than the same project page. Um, but our main findings, I think, had to do with the skills page. So in the second task we had them do, um, both users got to the skills page, but then kept navigating because they weren't confident that they had found um, the skills. So uh, that evidence was that when they were trying to find badges, which was the question that we had asked them was to find um, badges. Uh, they found the skills page uh, pretty quickly, but then they kept going for two or three more pages before getting back to the skills page. Um, so our recommendation for that would be to be more clear about the terminology with badges and skills and consider renaming um, skills to badges and we had other recommendations that were all related to this concept. Um, and then the last uh, finding we had was that both users uh, asked for types of social um, options. Um, so we suggest adding uh, the ability to share badges via social media. Awesome, it's a great idea. Okay. Anyone have anything to say? All right, well, great job, everybody. This is, I think these findings and recommendations came out really well. Um, and it just sort of goes to show you that, you know, just having two participants, you can get a lot of information. All right, let me... One more question, Eunice, but when we're doing studies on our own, is there a recommended study size sampling that we should aim for like a, a threshold to be yeah. a qualified study, a good sample. There, there is a kind of a, I think it's Jacob Nielsen, it's seven plus or minus two. So five, five to nine. Um, there's a curve of diminishing returns basically where after about five or six, you'll start hearing the same feedback over and over again. Um, but you do want to make sure you have that many for each user group. So for this study, for example, we'd want at least five or six, scholars and five or six uh, mentors. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, if you're also trying to find um, actually like reliable, statistically reliable differences, um, you're gonna have to test a lot more. Okay. Cool, so um, great job everyone. Uh, so just to review the findings, like I was saying, um, it's not just enough to kind of do the testing. You actually have to share your feet findings in a way that actually Hopefully your, 
your recommendations and what you learned will be implemented in the product. Um, so let's see if I can control here. So we want to talk just really briefly about different ways to, to present your research findings. Um, one thing to remember is that your presentation is not a report. Uh, it's not as detailed. And if you want to put all the details, consider putting them in the appendix. That's why we had you kind of focus on three main takeaways. Also, you need to know your audience and really think about the story that they want to hear. So talking to your product team might be more involved in like, oh, here are the future recommendations or enhancements. Whereas when you go take it to an executive level, you might just want to keep it at really detailed, like strong approval, this prototype is going to work, et cetera. Um, also remember metrics and quotes are very powerful. Also, they show that these findings aren't just your opinion. Um, and the quotes allow your customers to kind of speak through for, for you. Um, and it doesn't just sound like it's coming from the researcher. Um, and lastly, it's great to kind of find places where people have had issues or problems, but you also want to come up with potential um, improvements. That way you're, you're presenting a solution to the problem, not just identifying that there is a problem. Any questions on that? Cool. Well, then I'll let Eunice kind of show an example study. Yeah. So this is just, an ex again, an example of how we might present the Velvet Taco study. So in your first slide, usually you have an executive summary slide, um, but we don't have this one here. So the executive summary would be like maybe three or four bullet points saying, what did you do? And what, are the, what did you find out? And what would you recommend? Really straightforward, very um, high level. And then you go sort of deep dive into the uh, details of the study for the rest of the deck. So in this first, in this second slide, <laughs> you might introduce the study and describe your methods. Um, you can summarize your key metrics and then add a quote to convey the point that you want others to take away from your findings. Again, quotes are really powerful. If that's all that you remember, that's fine. You know, that's what's really great about it. Um, for the rest of the deck, you should focus on key findings and recommendations. In this example, we've pointed out two major themes, three specific recommendations, and we added that supporting data underneath in black. Um, it's really tempting, again, to put all your findings in the deck, but like Chris said, this is not a report. Focus on the ones that would make the most impact on users' experience, and at the same time, achieve stakeholders', stakeholders goals. Um, it's always a plus to have screenshots and to be, really, to be as concise as possible with your wording. Um, remember that less is more. I think that's all we have um, for the workshop. Um, anyone have any questions? This was excellent. So yeah, I'm glad. Um, I know it was a little rushed, <laughs> but we tried to squeeze everything in within two and a half hours. So maybe one of the questions would be for, um, we've got a lot of folks who maybe haven't done this yet. So, you've gone through the whole process. Can you set the scene for the um, actual stakeholder presentation you're giving? Who are you inviting? How long do you, what do you do to prepare? Do you tell them what you're gonna be presenting? How does that, what does that look like? Is that for um, this app? I mean, or are you just talking about in general? No, for like when you're actually sharing out the okay. So you said you have a PowerPoint presentation. What is, do you just send the PowerPoint as an email or are you actually standing up in front of people like the sausage behind the PowerPoint? Mm -hmm. How does all that come together? Um, Chris, you want to start? Sure. Or? Yeah, we definitely don't just send out PowerPoints. Um, the whole point is it's a presentation of findings. So, you know, we used to actually get in a room together. Now we just do it over, <laughs> over Zoom. Um, but yeah, you want to talk through your slides and open it up to questions along the way. It doesn't, normally it's not like a one-sided, just like listen to me explain. Um, it's really to, to spark discussion, um, which you'll get a lot of from your stakeholders. And, and then we also, what you'll start hearing is other things coming in about the, the feasibility of making these changes, either due to time frame or development constraints. Um, people with different outside opinions will, will get to, to, to share those as well. Um, so at least the way we do it at Pros is it's very much an, an inclusive team um, collaboration. But yeah, it, we also do have set an agenda ahead of time to let people know what they'll be discussing so they can come prepared so we don't just drop it on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and usually the stakeholders are the people who are requesting, you know, your, your, role, your work. So like the product manager, developers, um, even someone higher up, they're saying, you know, make this app or make this workflow. Um, you want to uh, include them in the beginning and show them what you're going to test 
before you even test it, just so that you get their approval and that we're, you're on the same page. Um, again, like you can always debrief them after every um, round. That's something we do as well. We'll just let them know, hey, here are the high level findings. We're gonna tweak it this way and we're gonna keep going forward. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, sorry, I had a, it was difficult to ask it, but you guys did a great job, thanks. <laughs> well, all right. I think with that, yeah, Eunice, you wanna just go to the very last slide we had here. Um, well, I first wanted to just thank Eunice and Chris for all of the amazing work that they've done to put this together. Um, we've had lots of sessions to get to where we are, um, and I'm just so thankful for their expertise and guiding us through in a really compartmentalized way so that we can learn how to do usability testing. So thank you for, for all of your expertise and your hard work. You're welcome, um, and thank you for, and Meredith and Jane as well, especially Jane pulling the prototype together at the end. Yes, I know, I, I do wanna do a shout out for Jane. She put a lot of effort <laughs> into that final prototype that you got to see today. Um, so we're very grateful for that. Um, just to close out this session, um, I know we're at time, so I'll just go through it really quickly, but I'm just really thankful and I hope that you guys have been able to get different things out of this series. Um, we've gone through these three different parts of a design sprint um, to hopefully give you some real world experience in the user-centered design process. Um, we're so thankful to have worked with Blue Chip Scholars on this entire project. Um, it's been a pleasure to have such um, complimentary missions with these two organizations. So I'm really thankful to Jessica and to all the scholars and the mentors who have participated along the way. Um, really appreciate all of the time that you have spent with us in this. Um, and so with that, um, you know, I wanted to open up just real quick that we've had a lot of people in the background that have been helping with these ongoing sessions and ongoing work to get us to where we are. And I wanted to put it out there. If people are interested in getting more involved in these types of um, activities and, and being more actively participate and a more active participant, um, reach out to Meredith or I on Slack and we can get you plugged into our facilitator channel to, for you to get more actively involved. Um, and then I've just got a couple quick announcements uh, to close us out. So we got a couple upcoming events. We have a virtual happy hour next week. Um, check it out in Meetup. So yay, we can just hang out. <laughs> um, and then we've got a mentorship wrap-up event that's not in Meetup yet, but that'll be on August 13th. And then we'll be starting our next mentorship cohort in September. So we're looking for mentors for that mentorship program and um, we'll be looking for applications for mentees in August. Um, and then I'm just going to put the, we always do kind of a post event survey. And so I am just going to post it in the chat there. So I hope that you'll um, give us your feedback on today's event um, and just help us continue to iterate and improve on the types of activities that we're providing for y'all. So with that, I hope you all have an amazing Saturday, a great weekend. Um, it was a pleasure spending the last several hours with you all. Um, and I hope to hear from you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you all so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 We take the survey.